Good afternoon, everyone, and you're very, very welcome <coughs> to this hybrid event at the Inter Institute for International and European Affairs on North Great Georgia Street. And a very special uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us online. This is the second in a series on the European Health Union in Ireland, which is supported by Janssen Science um, Ireland. The first one we had last November, and it focused on the issue of the implications of uh, the European Health Union on cancer services in Ireland. And today our focus is on rare diseases. Um, the format, let me say a few <coughs> words about the format. The format will be a presentation by our keynote speaker, who is Billy Kelleher, the MEP for Ireland South. And that will be followed by um, seven to 10 minutes uh, presentation by our three panelists today. They represent different areas, different perspectives, including uh, policy uh, practitioners and patient perspectives. The, we have Vicky McGrath, CEO at Rare Diseases Ireland, Professor Sean Gain, consultant respiratory physician at the Matter Hospital in Dublin, and Jennifer Lee, therapy area and market access leader at Janssen. After the uh, panel discussion and the presentation, um, we will then have a question and answer session and we would encourage those of you here today in person and those of you online to please put in your questions uh, please identify what organization if any you are with and give us your names also um, the panel discussion and the presentations are on our um, publicly will be publicly available and are on the record Please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA and a special welcome to those of you joining us um, on YouTube today. Now to the substance. Uh, I would now formally in, like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Billy Kelleher, and hand over to him. Billy Kelleher is an MEP for Ireland South. He was elected in May 2019 and is a member of the Renew, Air, uh, Renew Europe Group, the group to which Fianna Fáil belongs. Mr. Kelleher sits on the Economic and Monetary Affairs and Taxation Committees. He is also an active substitute member of the Committee on the Environment, Public Health and Food Safety, the Subcommittee on Public Health and the Special Committee on the COVID-19 Pandemic, Lessons Learned and Recommendations for the Future. Billy Keller has been a distinguished member of Shannon and Doyle Aaron, and he is a former Minister of State for Labour Affairs and for Trade and Commerce. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me here. I'm speaking from Brussels, so uh, delighted. Um, and first and foremost, thank you very much to the IIEA for their very kind invitation to give this keynote address. The issue of rare diseases and the treatments and supports needed uh, to assist those living with these incredibly challenging illnesses has been high on my political agenda for a long time. Uh, in my time as a Fianna Fáil health spokesperson for many years, I did my best to keep them on the political agenda. And now as an MEP since 2019, I'm advocating strongly for a common EU approach to this particular issue. Last week's publication of the EU's long awaited pharmaceutical strategy is a milestone for our continent. Outside of the many important pieces of legislation related to the Green Deal, I firmly believe it may be one of the most consequential proposals adopted by the co-legislators in the current commission mandate. So we have to get it right. Otherwise we run the risk of inhibiting innovation and ultimately um, the development of crucial medicines and treatments for Europeans and people all over the world. All of us, those in public office and those in the development and production of medicines must accept a number of key facts. One, medicines authorized in the EU do not at present reach patients quickly enough and are not equally accessible in all member states. Two, the significant gap remains in terms of addressing unmet medical needs, rare diseases and antimicrobial resistance. Three, the results in extremely high prices for innovative treatments, putting significant pressure on national governments when making decisions on whether to reimburse medicines or not. For in 2022 and into 2023, we have had shortages of medicines in the European Union. We are the wealthiest economic bloc on the planet and we should not have medicine shortages and our citizens expect more and they certainly deserve more. Five, in investment in new medicine development will be led by private sector for the main part. And this is a crucially important component as well. So we need to ensure 
that we incentivize investment and that there's capital available for investment as well. The European Union has a total budget of around 165 billion per year and national governments don't have the resources to fund all of the R&D that is essential and needed in these creative areas. So we must ensure that the EU remains an attractive place for investment and a world leader in the development of medicines. The status quo is no longer tenable. Digitization and the need to meet the climate objectives under the Green Deal require a way of working. And yes, we must also cut the red tape and simplify the approval procedures. During the COVID pandemic, I was critical of the duplication in terms of the approval procedures. Being in the EU must mean we trust our colleagues when we assess medicines, treatments and vaccines. So the idea that we have multiple approval mechanisms in place for assessing the efficacy of medicines, in my view, is um, you know, red tape, bureaucracy, uh, and very lethargic in terms of making assessments. Before I dive deep into the specific topic of rare diseases and the implications the new commission proposal may have, it's important to discuss the overall picture about what is in the pharmaceutical strategy. As you may have seen in the commission's proposal last week, there are four main pillars contained in the draft strategy. Ensuring access to affordable patient, medicines for patients and addressing the unmet medical needs. This is a very important in the areas of antimicrobial resistance and rare diseases, and it will require specific proposals and legislation. Supporting competitiveness, innovation and sustainability of the EU's pharmaceutical industry and the development of high quality, safe, effective, and greener medicines. Enhancing crisis preparedness, response mechanisms, diversified and secure supply chains, and addressing the medicines shortages. We, we saw, of course, during the COVID uh, pandemic that diversified and protected supply chains are critical. This will also feed into the EU's new policy on open strategic autonomy, but we must be careful not to allow ourselves to become overly protectionist as well. So we have to get the balance right between strategic autonomy and ensuring that we cooperate with other international partners in terms of trade and innovation and investment as well. Ensuring a strong EU voice in the world by promoting a high level of quality, efficacy and safety standards. This is the one thing in fairness that the EU is exceptionally good at and that's bringing about high benchmark standards for industry or in this case, in the areas of medicines. The EU's pharmaceutical industry is a critical component of our economy, no more so than in Ireland. We are all well aware of the thousands of well-paying jobs located right across Ireland that the pharma sector underpins. There are over 800,000 jobs directly related in the pharmaceutical sector in the European Union as a whole. And while many multiples of this related uh, indirectly in jobs as well, Ireland alone exports 62 billion of medical or pharmaceutical products each year. There is no doubt that the pharma industry helped keep Ireland afloat during the financial downturn of 2008 to 12, and also during the COVID pandemic shutdowns uh, more recently. We must never lose sight of the importance of these industries to our communities, to our citizens, and to the broader economy. That's why we need to get the pharma strategy right. There's a fine balance to be struck between ensuring that affordable medicines are available to citizens in a timely manner and also ensuring that pharma companies have the financial capital needed to invest in future medicines and treatments to bring them to market. According to the FDA in the United States of America, only about 12% of the drugs entering clinical trial ever end up going on sale in the market. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a shrill for big pharma, but I am a realist and a pragmatist. We need a competitive, yes, profitable pharmaceutical industry if we are to develop the best, most innovative, effective medicines for our citizens. We also need to end the disparity in terms of medicines becoming available in different countries at different times. Even in Ireland with a thriving pharmaceutical sector, we do not have access to the same number of drugs as in other countries. In 2018 to 2019, 51 drugs were approved for use and reimbursement in Ireland. Compare that to Germany, where there was 104 reimbursed. And you can see that there is a, a very serious disparity uh, between countries. However, it is worse in other parts of the European Union when you look at Eastern Europe, with only about 20 drugs coming onto the market in Romania, for example. So this really is, is a, an, an issue of equity and fairness 
across the European Union, and if we are to confer uh, rights on citizens, certainly in the area of access to medicines, the reimbursement issue is a fundamental issue in my view, and one that has to be addressed and can only be addressed at a European level in terms of making them available to all citizens, regardless of what member state they are born in or in terms of uh, financial um, cap capacity and, and societal uh, challenges. With regards to the rare diseases, for as long as I've been a public representative, I've met with representatives of people living with rare diseases. In each and every meeting, I hear about the same challenge, unmet medical needs. One rare disease that I've been very proud to work on is the PKU Alliance. I'm currently the chair of the PKU Alliance in European Parliament and organised a fruitful discussion with Commissioner Kirikidis about the orphan drug regulation and the wider pharmaceutical strategy late in 2022. It is very clear to me that the Commissioner gets the importance of rare diseases and I think it's obvious this issue has been to the forefront and centre in our drafting of the Commission's proposal. At present, over 7,000 rare diseases, including rare forms of cancer, have been identified with just one in 20 of them having a treatment option. 69% of people living with rare diseases only receive symptomatic treatment for their conditions. Rare diseases cause untold suffering for people living with them and for those caring for them. Individually, the number of people living with a particular rare disease is quite small, but cumulatively across the entire European Union, there are hundreds of thousands of people desperately in need of EU action to make their lives better. This is an area where the EU has to take a lead. Sadly, if we leave it to the industry alone, they will shy away from the investment because the commercial return and the risk is simply um, too high and too extreme and the return just not attractive enough. I firm, firmly believe that the European Commission is pro proposing will be welcomed by the rare diseases community in Ireland and across the European Union. Critically, they want to see more rapid regulatory pathways for new products and the incentivization of companies to develop desperately needed medicines. The proposed changes in terms of patient, uh, patent, sorry, in terms of patent protection, including extending the maximum protection time if medicines are released in all EU countries uh, within two years is at the outset, I believe a good proposal. And this goes back to what I said earlier on. We simply cannot have a situation where medicines are fed into the market across the European Union at different times and different intervals. I believe that when they are being made available, they must be made available across the entirety of the European Union. And I do believe that this issue around patient protection and getting the balance right with regard to um, releasing them to all member states is a, a worthy proposal put forward and I believe deserves scrutiny and um, you know, assessment of the impact it will have. A key change being proposed by the Commission is the incorporation of the European Medicines Agency uh, Priority Medicine Schemes Prime in the regulatory framework to accelerate product development and authorization in areas of unmet needs. It simply takes too long for many of these drugs to be authorized for use. One space where I feel progress can be made is in the area of rare diseases is the recently proposed European Health Union. Health, as most of you will know and be aware, is not a core competency of the European Union. So to see concrete proposals around a health union is of seismic importance from a political and societal uh, perspective with regard to the European Union. Now, of course, I don't believe we will be ever see the Commission running our hospitals, but there is so much that can be done at pan-European level to make this uh, attractive. Let's look at the issue in the field of rare diseases that are so vitally important. A baby born in Ireland is tested for nine different diseases or syndromes using a simple, inexpensive heel prick test. However, if that child is born in Spain, they would be tested for 24 diseases or syndromes. Yet in France, the test would only look for six of these diseases or syndromes. If you were born in Italy, they would test for 35. So we have a lot of work to do. These tests are crucially important in diagnosing of rare life-threatening illnesses. How can we truly know the prevalence of rare diseases if we aren't uniformly testing all our children in all member states on a uniform basis? This is just one example of how we can and must work better 
at EU level in health. Central to the European Health Union will be, of course, the pharmaceutical strategy and associated legislative acts. The establishment of a European Health Union, a set of guidelines, principles and rules that all countries agree to implement and uphold across the Union. However, this will require treaty change. And as you all know, EU treaty change in Ireland is a very difficult conversation. In two of the last three referenda on the EU, the Irish people voted no first and then following clarifications and guarantees agreed to support Nice II and Lisbon II treaties. Irish governments are always hesitant about going to the people on EU treaty change because for most of the time, the conversation on the substance of the treaty gets caught up and drowned out by local domestic political issues or scaremongering from anti-EU brigade of which there is enough of in our country. Right now, there's a lot of scaremongering campaign going on against the World Health Organization pandemic treaty. There is no logic to it, but it's part and parcel of modern political life in Ireland regarding these issues. Finally, I want to talk about what is not in the Commission proposal yet. A lot of people, depending on their point of view, either support the Commission's ideas or have issues with them. We need to remember that this is only the starting point. My colleagues in the European Parliament will amend, add and delete sections of this proposal. Likewise, national governments through the European Council will do the same. So all of us who care passionately about equal access to medicines for people living with rare diseases and a vibrant pharmaceutical sector across the European Union need to keep an eye on what these two bodies are proposing. So once again, thank you very much for the opportunity to give my initial thoughts on the pharmaceutical strategy and how it may affect many people living with rare diseases. Gurumila Mahogud Galair. Thank you very much, Billy, and I hope you'll be able to stay with us for the Q&A session. Yeah, that's great. Now we'll come to our first panelist. Our first panelist is Vicky McGrath. Uh, Vicky is the Chief Executive Officer at Rare Diseases Ireland, the National Alliance for Rare Disease Patient Organizations in Ireland. Rare Diseases Ireland advocates for people affected by or at risk of developing a rare disease. Vicky came to Rare Diseases Ireland from industry where she spent 20 years in various leadership roles within the life sciences sector in the United States and Ireland. She has a Bachelor of Engineering, a Master's in Engineering and an MBA, and she is a Fellow of BioInnovate Ireland. Vicky, you have the floor. Very much, Mary. <clears throat> um, Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today uh, to everybody in the room and to those online. It was great to have an opportunity uh, to speak about rare diseases uh, to, to such a wide audience. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, um, a rare disease is defined at an EU level, a role that the, uh, I guess Europe plays in Ireland, and it's one in 2,000 people affected by a disease. As Billy mentioned, there are 7,000 plus rare diseases, and there are being more, I guess, elucidated on a daily basis as research continues. Um, there's about 300,000 people in Ireland living with rare diseases. Um, I think if we if we reflect on, I guess we hear a lot about them in children, 4.2% uh, of your average 18 year old cohort have already been diagnosed with a rare disease. Um, so, you know, it's it, the impact, I guess, on Irish society is, is enormous. Um, I estimate that there's about 50,000 children living with rare diseases and 250,000 adults. Um, in terms of uh, children, I'm like most of them will visit one of the children's hospitals here in Dublin and will receive expert care through through that system. Sadly, when many transition to adulthood, there isn't any expert care available and they literally they, they face a cliff edge and, and fall off and it's really um, terribly difficult for them. And that's one of the areas where we really feel that EU is 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 going to help. Uh, to to uh, enhance the care for people living in Ireland. Um, we have obviously the cross-border directive, which many people know about. Um, and an element of that is the European reference networks and enabling access to expert care for all people living with rare diseases right across Europe. And this is the, the a linchpin we feel in Rare Diseases Ireland to ensure adequate care for people living with rare diseases here. Um, uh, the last uh, survey that we performed around care 
care, uh, the healthcare experiences of people living with rare diseases in Ireland indicated that a little over 30% of people felt they had no expert care in the country. So these are people that are having to travel to try and get their expert care. And the ERNs coming into Ireland are, are a critical component of that. Of course, when we say ERNs coming into Ireland, and you will see it in, I think, probably about 80 to 90% of the press releases over the last 18 months from, from the Minister and from the Department of Health. If anything references rare diseases, it will talk about we have ERNs in Ireland. Um, we have some labels on people's doors. Nothing has been funded. Nothing has actively happened. And this is where we need groups like the EU Parliament and the and the, the Commission to actually force this, to force the arms, twist the arms and make sure that this is real, that there's a real experience for people on the ground to ensure that actually when we talk about uh, sharing knowledge and expertise and research, that this is a real experience for people, that it's not, um, I guess, written on a piece of paper somewhere that this is what happens. Um, it's very frustrating and I know <laughs> Professor Kane might 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 uh, add add some more comments on that, but it's it's incredibly frustrating to realise that the ERNs will answer many questions for both for people living in Ireland with rare diseases, but also around the I guess registries and access to information. These are you know a, these are the linchpins uh, for us, but yet we have done nothing to enable real uh, integration of ERNs into Ireland and that is certainly one of the, the key things that we will be working on and where we see the role for Europe to be so critical. Um, I understand that from the, the, the uh, DG Sante's perspective, rare diseases and Europe, that they, this is a really added value for the whole EU in setup around healthcare um, is in the rare disease space um, because of the lack of knowledge and information and the need to share cross border. And so it's critically important that we really do uh, do some more work around that. Um, I, there's many pieces, I guess, of, of the EU and how the or the the role that it could have in rare diseases and for the rare disease community in Ireland. To name a few, I'm like, we all know the wonderful work that EMA does, that we all had our own regulators, you know, 20 years ago, and now it just happens magically at an EU level. I can't comprehend how we're not heading down a similar route for health technology assessment. I know we're beginning to make, you know, scratch at the surface, but we really need to think about where are we going to be in 20 years time? We don't have the expertise in this country. We're too small a country to have the expertise and the knowledge to be able to do all of this heavy lifting ourselves. Likewise, all of the other small European countries, we need to pool our resources and actually enable this to happen on an EU wide basis. I really do feel quite strongly about that. Um, I think the NCPE, so our own HTA assessment body here in Ireland, I, th I think they employ something like 40 people give or take um you know realistically if we're going to keep up keep pace with what what is proposed now in the new eu pharma legislation that everything gets approved within two years we're going to be doubling tripling quadrupling i don't know where we're going to get the health economists to fill all of these roles but you know we've got to think sensibly about this as a country um on the, the newborn screening that billy Kelleher was referring to there um we have nine a tenth has been recommended hasn't been implemented yet the N, or not the NCP, but uh, NSAC, the new, uh, no, the National Screening Advisory Committee was established four years ago. We have added one test to the heel prick test in that four year period at the HSE. So children today versus children and newborns four years ago, they have one more rare disease they're being tested for. There is a list of, I think, 33 to 35 rare diseases to be added. At this rate, we will all be long since gone, as will our children and our grandchildren by the time we get through those. So, you know, again, we need to look at how can we leverage Europe? What can Europe do for us? This is a lot of desk work that needs to be done. We need the, the people that are in the country to actually do the physical work that needs to be done in the country and to try and offload as much of this desk work as possible. And again, it's a no brainer in my world. You know, if we can do it with EMA, we've got to look at all of those other areas where there's a lot of desk work. Um, the, the, the pharma legislation, I know that's a hot topic. Uh, it's fresh off the presses. I know there was a leaked copy uh, you know, two months ago or something like that, but I didn't get into too much detail because I was sure everything would be perfect by the time we got to it last week. Um, but I, I guess my gut feel now is, wow, it's complex. 
wow, this is not going to be easy to do. Um, I think that it's not really going to help innovation. I think it's going to hinder access to medicines. And it's an awful thing to say. The two year timeline might make a lot of sense, but I just I, I, I don't I, I, it doesn't grab me as being, yeah, this is the way to go. This is definitely I think that we're you know potentially beating ourselves up uh over something that we need to be far more agile and innovative in our approach to how this happens i've heard lots of talk about the carrot and stick i i see quite a bit of stick not a huge amount of carrot i'm particularly galled by the concept that things must be approved within two years of ema approval or or be be reimbursed within two years of ema approval um for for drugs but if it's a rare disease drug one uh, day or sorry then you get two years extra uh, patent protection but with a rare disease you only get one year extra so like, well that's completely counterproductive if there's only one or two patients why would you you know and it, it just it strikes me as being slightly retrograde uh, which is uh, maybe a harsh way to put it we as a group will try our hardest to to i guess get our heads around what the legislation actually means and certainly to to make submissions and to 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 get a rare disease voice into this and i guess we'd really be looking for the people in the room the people online to help us as a group and also just you know ireland ireland needs to step up to the plate we're we're very good at waiting to see what everybody else is saying and doing we need to be leading on this we know we have the install base of pharma manufacturing we have a really good r d the sfi all of those kind of r d systems we have great access to what's happening in the states many of our consultants have been trained over there and have come back here so you know we know we could think really cleverly and we have a really i, I guess lots of people are very interested in our view of the world i think we have a good way with people and we need to leverage that to the advantage of the rare disease community in ireland and i really do feel that if we can do it to the advantage of the rare disease community in ireland it will be to the advantage of everybody in this room all of the stakeholders and to the rest of europe it terrifies me the concept that you know, only 12% of trials are, are even ever going to get to market. And that I know is the magic of science and things like that. But even when things do get to market and still we're waiting years and years and you have patients standing on Kildare Street, it's unconscionable that we allow that to happen. And I think that the EU is, is a tool for us to leverage as a country to the benefit of us, to enable us to get quicker access and to, to innovate further right across the health system. I have a, a, an old uh, boss of mine used to always talk about the three biggest challenges in any business, communication, communication, communication. And that's what this is. The magic of science is delivering products. It's about the communication. It's about how we're transferring information, sharing information and moving forward uh, rather than saying, we can't do this. We need to do something very different. And I think that Europe should be a resource that we leverage to enable us to do something very different. Thank you very much, Vicky. And thank you for your passion. You brought to that as well as your insight. Um, so I will now hand the floor to our second panelist, Professor Sean Gain. Professor Sean Gain is a consultant respiratory physician at the Matter Hospital in Dublin and a director of the National Pulmonary Hypertension Unit. He completed his med medical education at Trinity College Dublin and at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. During his uh, pulmonary and critical care fellowship, he obtained his PhD for work exploring the control of pulmonary vascular function. The floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for your passion, Vicky, on the topic um, of rare diseases. Yeah, so I just, uh, I'll give you a bit of a perspective of what it's like to care for people with rare disease. And um, I, yeah, I spent um, over a decade in the US and Johns Hopkins and set up a, a pulmonary hypertension program there. It was a fascinating time because when I started, there was no treatment for a particular disease that affects uh, people called pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension typically at that time was a disease that affected young women, usually in the mid twenties, and uh, they would come in increasingly breathless and uh, would die within two years. And uh, the job of someone in that disease area was to comfort and manage in a palliative way at young women who often just had a baby. And, and that was a trigger for the disease to occur. It's a remarkable uh, story. The first thing that uh, came about that helped those patients was heart-lung transplant. In fact, the first person in the world to have a heart-lung transplant successfully 
was a young lady with, uh, with pulmonary hypertension. Uh, she wrote a book, and the book I always think is very interesting, is the title was I'll Take Tomorrow. And, and that's, I think, the, the situation for so many of our patients who have rare diseases. I'll take tomorrow. Give me, give me what you've got. It may be a new drug. There may be side effects. There may be issues with it. But can I just have one more day? And that was what she went through to have a heart-lung transplant. It, it was successful in the short term, not in the longer term. The rest of the story is remarkable also in that it's a remarkable success rate for pharma. Um, when I started, there were no drugs for pulmonary hypertension. There are now three products that are available. Life expectancy is no longer two years. And I'll give you an example that I lost a lady uh, last year. Uh, I'd managed her for 17 years. Uh, she presented to me after delivering her second child. And her wish at the time was to see that child grow up to some stage. First of all, it was to get to First Communion, then it was to get a confirmation, then it was to get to 18. And uh, ultimately, uh, she saw her get to 18 and then she died. She uh, couldn't get transplanted because uh, ultimately she was small frame. Uh, she got very sick, transplant turned her down. Ultimately, she'd been on the list for five years waiting for a lung transplant. Um, but the reason I bring up her story, she was on those trios. She lasted 17 years. She got to do the things that she wanted to do. It was a pleasure taking care of her. But, um, uh, and she had the three drugs available. Each of those three drugs uh, that were available were available fast for her in Ireland at that time. That's changed now. But at the time, I was able to get those drugs quickly for her, get her on board, and have her live a reasonable quality of life until the end. And almost as soon as she died, another 21-year-old arrived in. And uh, I thought to myself, what's different about what's going to happen for her now? Um, what's changed in me then? First of all, I'm not looking her to die in two years. I'm expecting her to live longer. Um, my biggest worry for her now is that um, there are new therapies coming down the pipeline. She knows about them because she's on the internet. She's, she, you know, it's a different generation, 17, 18 years later, and she knows what's coming. She knows, for example, like most, that there was a New England Journal paper last month showing a new drug for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, there's a lot of excitement about it, but she also knows from talking to people online that Ireland is one of the slowest countries in Europe to get that drug for her. She won't see it for maybe three, four years, even if she does. And as a result of that, we've, we're starting her on an intravenous infusion uh, therapy, uh, which is very cumbersome. It's very expensive. It's all we've got uh, to get her that extra mile. So the therapeutic options that we'll have available for her for the next number of years uh, are, are going to be somewhat limited. Uh, and I think that that timeline is way too long, as, as Vicky points out, and, and, and as uh, uh, Billy Keller has pointed out, it's, it's way too long. And the fact that I'll be slower than my colleagues in France and Spain and, and Italy when I meet them at international meetings and I have my patient who's on what would be considered old school approach at that stage, I think is, uh, is very difficult. Um, and uh, it shouldn't be that way. Just a bit, of, a bit of news on that too. So we were all really excited uh, when there was a big push to get uh, pulmonary hypertension into the ERN, uh, rare lung disease. And we were very excited about that because I would share what Vicky said and what Billy has said that Europe is, um, has a, is a great potential to be able to push things forward here, set, set, bound, um, set guidelines. Um, I, I mentioned about the big stick in some ways, but be able to say, look, um, you need to deliver these things quickly. So uh, an unusual event in, in an in a, in an Irish healthcare story, a number of Irish hospitals got together. So uh, the St. Vincent's University Hospital, the Matter Hospital and Beaumont Hospital got together under the Irish Thoracic Society to come up with a consortium of rare lung diseases and made an application to get in to cover cystic fibrosis, to cover uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin, to cover pulmonary hypertension, to cover uh, rejection for lung transplant, interstitial lung disease. And we all came together and put our expertise together and uh, were successful in the application to join the ERN rare lung diseases. And the real reason we were most excited about that was we thought then that because of our European backing, we then would get funded to be able to lift our boat up to the same level as our colleagues in Europe. And um, the truth is, we're not in the estimates for this year. And as a result of that, we now are making a decision about whether we pull out before we're kicked out. And the, there's a decision to be made, do you pull out of an ERN so that you don't have the humiliation of being kicked out? Do you leave beforehand and saying, look, we got into this, we were hopeful we'd be able to keep up to the standards that have been set. But unfortunately, we don't have the ability to stay at the standard that we need. And the standards are really simple. In the matter, for example, we applied for a, a promotion of a nurse to an advanced nurse practitioner so they could manage the program. 
and we applied for a database coordinator so they could introduce the data that Europe needs to know how many patients we're taking care of. So it's not big asks. You're not looking for a new building. You're not looking for new expensive equipment. We weren't even looking for new drugs. We were looking for administrative support to be able to match our, our colleagues in Europe and be able to uh, be in that club properly so that we could then start to develop this in the future. Um, so I, I leave you with uh, caring for patients with it. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to take care of uh, people who face these challenges. And also, I suppose, to have the teamwork that I have around me to be able to manage these patients. But it is uh, distressing to know that there are ways we can do things better and faster that don't come at necessarily a huge cost that are not available to us uh, at the moment. And I think it's fantastic to see the interest that's in this area of rare diseases. You never know when a rare disease will come your way. It's rare until you get it yourself, and then it's not quite so rare. So it is, it is, and you can hear from the number of people in Ireland who have it, it's not insubstantial. We feel Co Park a number of times with people who go home every day knowing that they have something that is uncommon, and there aren't many people you bump into with it, but when they come together, they're quite a force. So I, my, my last comments, I suppose, on it, I would share uh, Vicky's passion for we can make a difference. Um, I think that the European Union has a real role to play in pushing us to match the standards that we know we're well capable of achieving and, and uh, going beyond and actually beginning to lead the rest of Europe in the way that we would approach things. Um, but I'd like to see this young lady that I now have, I'd love to see her have a better outcome again than the last lady that I spoke of, that she'll live longer than that, uh, that 17, 18 years. I think with the therapeutics we have available and the expertise we have available, new equipment and new transplant facilities, I think we can get even further for her but I am concerned that the urgency isn't there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm struck again, not just by the passion, but by the optimism you have uh, as to the potential benefits of the, the European Health Union. Yeah. Um, our final panelist is um, Jennifer Lee. Jennifer is a trained health economist and biochemist originally from Canada. She holds a a Bachelor of Science in Biology, Biochemistry, and MBA in Finance, and a postgraduate in Pharma Economics. She's currently a therapy area market access leader with Europe, Middle East, and Africa region at Janssen, and is based in Copenhagen. You have the floor. Thanks, Mary. Um, so as you just heard from Mary, my role does cover Europe, Middle East, Africa. So whilst I'm clearly not an expert on Ireland, um, I do know quite a bit about you know, the policies in the EU and, and that's what I wanted to kind of mention today and what I think, you know, the impact could be on some of the smaller countries such as Ireland. And I share your passion and your optimism and the frustration as well, um, because I see it in many other countries. So I wanted to also share some stats um, about rare disease in general. And I think everyone already touched upon it, but really in Europe, an estimated 30 million people have a rare disease. Um, half of whom have not yet received a diagnosis. So, you know, I would question, is 30 million people rare? That's not, that's not rare. That's a lot of people in the European Union uh, to be helped. And I think in previous decades, um, rare diseases were, were pretty much invisible, right, um, in national healthcare systems. This has improved a lot, though, um, and it's really encouraging to hear what you were just saying about, you know, there's people out there that care, that are really improving care for these patients. Um, you might want to know that 20 years ago, so that was with the, when the previous um, EU pharma legislation, like the last major overhaul of it, um, they there was very few formal orphan products. Now, those are the treatments that are for patients with rare disease in Europe. Um, at the time, the number that were approved by the European Meds Agency were only eight, eight, okay? So single digit prior to the introduction of the EU's orphan reg uh, regulation in 2000. Um, now, over the past two decades, that's improved. And today there's about 200 or just over 200 orphan medicines approved in the European Meds Agency. Um, so I think time, right now is a real time for hope for rare disease patients, but there's still a lot that needs to be done to improve care, to get the right diagnosis and the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Um, and moreover, in a way that's sustainable for our healthcare systems across Europe, because we do, we have to acknowledge there's a sustainability issue here um, and, and there's an affordability issue, we, we know that. Uh, I just wanted to touch upon the, the weight indicator um, across Europe. So that's across not just the EU, but also you know, comparable countries such as, such as the UK. Um, 
on average, only 39% of innovative orphan products are available across the EU. And in Ireland, only 26% of orphan medicines are available. And this is the, the statistic that, that shocked me. So the average time it takes for an orphan medicine to become available on the European market is 635 days. And in Ireland, it's even longer uh, at 877 days. So there, there is room for improvement. Um, just to say in, in relation to the EU pharma legislation that the national governments uh, of the member states are still and will remain in the driving seat when it comes to healthcare provision and funding, that is a, that is a member state um, capability. Um, but EU policy obviously covers uh, you know, all member states. And I think particularly since the pandemic, we've seen a lot of um, interesting changes. So we're now entering a time, um, as Vicky said, the, the legislation was released last week um, where these policies will start to have an impact. Um, extraordinarily wide ranging list of initiatives. Obviously I'm not gonna repeat them. Um, Billy Kelleher already talked us through the major ones, but I you know, strongly believe that EU member states um, have a major role to play in the fight against rare diseases. And you know, I've, I've come from Canada, I've worked in Australia, I've worked in the UK, I've worked all across Asia Pacific. So I've seen the impact of different healthcare systems on the health of different citizens in, in different countries. And I, and I, I know firsthand. Um, what national policies can do. And I firmly believe that the EU has such an opportunity here with you know, 27 member states and many, many patients, if we get this right, um, the European health data space, if we get that initiative right, together with the European reference networks, where as you were both saying, you can share the knowledge on the best care, best practice across Europe, no matter where you, where you are, where those patients are, because they're rare. They're, they're hard to find, right? Um, and if we share that data and share that knowledge and create a pan-European healthcare data system with interoperable you know, systems across the countries, we will know so much more about rare disease. Um, and it'll, I think it'll be, it could be the world's most powerful data set to improve patient outcomes and healthcare efficiency for rare disease patients. The EU has such an opportunity to get this right. And I know that the UK is just kicking themselves. <laughs> what did we do? Um, because to be part of this powerful data set, I think is such, a, such an opportunity, but the funding has to go behind it. And I share your concern about the European reference networks. It's only as good as the funding continues. Um, and we need to link that up with the, um, the European health reference network. Um, I think the thing to say about the pharma legislation and when we talk about orphan and pediatric and the regulations there, um, you know, currently we have eight years of patent protection, but what the, the, the legislation is saying, it'll drop back down to six, and then you can creep back up basically, but two years, um, if you do launch your medicine across the EU 27 within the two years. And what I would say there is, you know, obviously I share the concern that there's inequity across, across Europe uh, in terms of patient access, we, we all do. But the pricing and reimbursement is still going to be a, a national level competency. So I personally don't, sorry, I don't I personally don't understand how you can then say within two years we'll make the medicine available everywhere if you're still waiting for a pricing and reimbursement decision in one of those member states. Um, I think that the the thing that we are moving on though at European level is the, the EU joint clinical assessment. So uh, in, in reference what Vicky was saying earlier about health technology assessment, the first part will be done now at an EU level um, in terms of comparing the new treatment clinically uh, to what is currently available. That You will get a, a member state report, but it will still remain up to the member states to then assess that and de determine what the value is of that. Um, because obviously every healthcare system across Europe is different. So that, that value assessment will remain at the member state level. Um, so I am concerned uh, about the, the, the two-year regulation, particularly for, for rare disease, because let's say you don't even have a specialist center in a small country. And, and let's say that that medicine, you know, is not going to be available in that country because there's not, not going to be anyone to treat those patients. The better thing to do there is to get the cross-border healthcare directive actually working and so that you can set up these clinical sites of, in the specialist um, centers that are across Europe and make sure that patients are moving across the, the EU27. 
that is a more pragmatic way of doing this. Um, it's, it's just not practical in some of the smaller countries uh, where there may not be a specialist site and there may only be a handful of patients um, to, to make sure that that's available within two years. It's, it's, it's not practical. So um, yeah, what I would leave you with, I guess, is you know, this, this country uh, definitely has a lot going for it when it, when it comes to rare disease policy, for example, you have a national rare disease policy, which in many countries in the EU, they, they don't. Um, but I think that the, the strong um, life science ecosystem we have in, in, in Ireland, and I know, I mean, my own company employs up to you know, 5,000 people in manufacturing in Cork. So there's a huge manufacturing life science base in Ireland that's really important to, to Irish GDP. And there's you know, great science here as well. Um, but there's definitely room for improvement when it comes to the, the patient wait times. And I think everybody's already referred to that. The last stat I'll leave you with is Ireland ranks 27th out of 35 European countries in the time it takes to access new medicines. So that's the time between the European Meds Agency marketing authorization and actual patient access to reimbursement. So that means patients with rare disease in Ireland take it have to wait three and a half times longer, more than patients in Denmark, where I live, more than twice as long as patients in the Netherlands, and more than twice as long as, as patients in England. So I, I would suggest there's room for improvement, but there's definitely um, optimism in this room and certainly optimism from, from people like me who have to look across all of Europe uh, in, our, in our jobs that this country really does have the opportunity to, to be part of the solution, to join together with Europe um, and, and to be the best. So that's the uh, message I'd like to leave you with. Thank you very much. Um, that I think nicely runs off that, that part of the discussion. So the floor is open to both people here in the room and those of you online using the Q&A. Um, please uh, do identify yourselves and any organization that's relevant. Um, could I maybe start off the, the uh, discussion by putting a question to Billy? And also, if there's a, a question you want to direct to one of the panelists or to Billy Kelleher, please do identify that. Um, you spoke very strongly about access issues, um, but I, I want to understand better myself, given that decisions on the pricing and reimbursement of medicines are the purview of the member states, how exactly will the health, um, the, the European Health Union, facilitate uh, greater access, um, given that, if you like, that particular uh, problem? Yeah, well, I can remember um, in 2017, I was standing outside Dáil Éireann as a spokesperson for, for my party in health. We were in opposition. Uh, we were advocating for patients. Government is inside the building. They have challenges around budgets and finance. Um, and we were campaigning for Orcambi and I think Reprisa for uh, patients with cystic fibrosis. It was November and it was pelting rain and it was about three degrees Celsius. Uh, and I felt like that, you know, there was a better way of doing things rather than I outside with patients and a government inside. Now the government inside, if, if, we, if we changed the, the, the makeup of the government, they would have been outside and I would have been inside. But the point is, it was just wrong. But I think the key issue here is that at least from now on, if we have a proper health union where you have the health technology assessment done at centralized level, um, the, e, the European Medicines Agency approving the health technology assessment done, that then it is approved across Europe. It then puts huge pressure on governments to have to fund, as opposed to this process that was in place previously, which was very drawn out. I mean, the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics would put forward their health technology assessment to go to the Department of Public Expenditure, back to health, over and back. So they were, the system was able to slow down the approval process. But at least if it was done out Central European um, level, countries and governments would be exposed in the event they're prevaricating over whether or not they would actually reimburse. So at least there will be some element of democratic embarrassment, if no more. But I do think longer term, we have to look at a hypothecated fund system, whereby if it's approved at central European level, as I hope it will be, uh, that then there will be a fund in place to assist countries that may have budgetary challenges from time to time, or member states that have just poor budgetary uh, positions uh, most of the time, and that you would be able to spread that load across 
the entirety of the European Union. Otherwise, you're back to where you are, which means member states um, chop and choose as to when or not they approve. Um, Ireland, even though we, you know, financially we're doing quite well from the point of view of overall budgets, we are still a laggard when it comes to the approval process for medicines. And I certainly do not want a situation where a country with our capacity has to put patients outside Dáil Éireann uh, to request the approval of a medicine that's available in other member states. So the short question is, at least if it's done centrally, it also takes up less resources to do these things centrally, um, but governments then will not be able to prevaricate or delay the decision by obfuscation of a system at member state level. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, anybody here looking for the, for the floor? Uh, oh, very shy today. Uh, yeah, yes, I would second what Billy is saying there. I know of products now that have actually been approved for reimbursement and are still sitting in the HSE waiting for that final signature. So we have stuff that's been in there that uh, was approved uh, by EMA maybe about three or four years ago, I think it was 2018. And we know that the Drugs Committee, so it's gone from NCPE to CPU to the Drugs Committee, to the Technology Review Committee, back to the CPU, uh, backwards and forwards, but it's still waiting for that senior leadership team sign off. And it's probably about nine or 10 months since there was a last that we know of action on this. And therefore, there's patients in this country that are not getting access because of this delay. Some of them are fortunate enough that they've been able to travel to get access. But how much is that costing the state versus if it was available here today? And I would say that the role, I'm like, I guess, the value of the ERNs in driving best in class care I mean, we will be on a two tier, we will be on the lower track if we don't give access to drugs that other people living with rare diseases across Europe are getting access to. The other thing I would say about the whole idea of being out on Kildare Street, cystic fibrosis and cystic fibrosis Ireland is an incredibly well established patient organization there they have a lot of I guess resources there's a lot of people in the country it's probably not that rare condition in Ireland. But when we talk about some of the others, there might be one or two. What impact are they going to have on Kildare Street? And how are they going to get access to these things if this is our route for getting access to medicines? We've got to do something that, you know, that eliminates the fact that, well, I'm a not rare, rare disease or I'm an ultra rare disease and I may as well just pack up my tent and go home. It's not equitable. It's not, it's not a society that we should be enabling. Just make a comment. Is not good for your health. So if you, you know, <laughs> you think? yeah, Brexit I mean, quite weak, in November in the rain. but it's, yeah. So, I mean, can you imagine that being a young person of cystic fibrosis who really passionately believes in that, in that topic? Now, there might be, there's lots of sides to that argument, but they're out in the rain fighting their cause. And I've got patients with pulmonary hypertension who can't walk the length of this room without being severely breathless. But when they, when they feel that this is their job to go and do it, they put themselves at risk. I mean, the difference, for example, in my disease, in the difference in pulmonary artery pressure in your lungs can, can double in the face of stress. If we're inside in a cath lab and we're looking at the numbers and then something happens, something crashes on the ground or it's a noise, the pressures go way through the roof. So being politically active, that's not what I want from a patient. I want them to be quiet, to live their lives to the best they can and have other people like the EU, like their politicians, other people see that this is, this is something that is common sense. You have a drug, it's available in France, can we have it now in Ireland, please? Because it's been available in France for the past six months and people are enjoying the benefits of that, not to be out in the street with it. It's bad for their health. Can I just ask you, um, both of you, and maybe Jennifer also, um, both of you have described a situation um, in different contexts. One was with the heel pricks, um, where it just takes very long. Um, with authorizing medicines, it takes very long. Have we created just a very complicated system, the solution to which is to simplify and remove layers. And that's a very bureaucratic thing that one doesn't need much expertise to do. Um, I mean, I, yes, I mean, I would say there's probably better ways or simpler ways of doing it. And I think if we do share the workload, as Billy is saying, across Europe, we would enhance it for everybody. Um, I think that, um, yeah, it's, I'm like, you hear about countries, say, for example, I mean, not to not to talk about particular products, but Zalgensma for SMA spinal muscular atrophy, you know, a newborn is born, isn't diagnosed at birth, 
until they they can't sit up and stuff and it becomes oh there's something going on here we better find out and then they go through the the, the um, process of getting a diagnosis and whatever and so they're already deteriorating in health and there was a fabulous meeting just before christmas around us and and it, and it's just i mean you see you know younger siblings of an older child that are, you know are being diagnosed because there's an older sibling and the, the outcomes for them are so different it's kind of like this just doesn't make sense and everybody's sitting there saying this doesn't make sense but still we have to go through the three years of paperwork and the this and the that and the other it's kind of like let's expedite this let's put the resources where they are needed to make it happen today we know it's available in other countries what is magically different about Ireland nothing realistically other than we want to do it here I would suggest that we suffer from a severe case of NIH not invented here if it's not written by an Irish person therefore it doesn't really hold in Ireland and I don't think that that's fair and I think if we again reflect back on the fact that EMA was established and I'm sure there was lots of concern and fear initially but yet we're all very happy with the work that it does now um, and I think that we need to be far more proactive to enable small countries to sit at the table with the big countries who have far more people available to them to do this type of work. And I, I despair of the fact that our drugs committee, uh, just as, as one example, our drugs committee meets typically once a month, uh, definitely not more than once a month, and that there are a series of consultants sitting around a table looking pushing pieces of paper, they should be in front of patients. I would like to see people like that with the patients all the time, see the effect that that will have on our waiting list. And I know that for many people in the healthcare system, there is a large amount of time spent doing stuff that actually other people could do that could be outside of their remit, that they're actually do their face, patient facing work far more and, and have a much more beneficial effect to, to us as a whole, as a society help data space can help with that then because I obviously I've just heard you say the not invented here syndrome and definitely Ireland's not alone there's many countries in Europe it's like you know even some of the big ones particularly you yep. know if you look at the EU JCA some of the big ones are very against it because they're like no thank you we'll make our own decisions thank you very much um so I'm just wondering if if there was one source of truth right so if you could actually set up a registry for every single rare disease can European um, everybody fed into the system, whether it was, you know, clinicians, patient groups, every, all stakeholders, um, and everybody saw that as the one source of truth. Do you think that would help with these sorts of things? Because you'd speed up, you know, diagnosis, presumably, especially if you linked it with genomics, um, and it could speed up, you know, knowledge about the disease. And also, for example, if there's concern about reimbursing something, some of these newer therapies, it's, it's one-time treatment. Mm -hmm. So there's concern about long-term efficacy and safety durability so you know what if you were able to say we'll conditionally reimburse you and we'll follow these patients using this this one source of truth in the registry do you think that would help in terms of speeding up access but like can only but hope that it does i'm sure there'll be lots of growing pains with a system like that and it's a big it's a big ask but you know i i guess that there's concern over sharing data yeah. and about you know, uh, bad actors getting access and, and things like that. But I can guarantee you that if I go into Facebook, I will be able to identify all of the patients in Ireland living with, particularly with the ultra-rate disease. We know them. We know them already because they're out there. They're telling their stories. They're sharing their information because they're trying to get attention. And so, you know, I guess the slightly patronizing paternalistic approach of, oh, you don't know or you know we you don't need to we want to we really want to we want to see this happening we want to see the data being shared and i think that if it if it provides i guess the reinsure reassurance to the pharma and to payers that actually we're all on a level playing field we're paying the same amount and we're looking at the same set of information and we're making decisions with the same amount of information and you know i i, I guess that experts in different countries feel that they're more expert than an expert in another country if you're such an expert why aren't you sharing your expertise with everybody else why aren't you teaching everybody else and that you know it, it, the mind boggles and i think as you referenced earlier on the concept of getting three or four 
you know, senior respiratory physicians in different hospitals to come to the table and say, you know what, yeah, we're better together than not. We'll do this better together as a, as a group thing. That's, that's you know, uh, that, that's a, a game changer in Ireland mm -hmm. amongst that, the, those, those people. And, and I know it doesn't work with all of them. We didn't get into all of the ERNs, but I think that we have an option to do it. And therefore, I think we should be pushing really hard to make sure that we share. Uh, we have quite a few questions coming in now, so I'm going to try and group them. Uh, this question is from Keith Smart, Smart uh, Lecturer, Assistant Professor, School of Public Health, Physiotherapy and Sports Science. And he's, he thanks the panel and he says, can the panel discuss how rare diseases might best be researched using clinical trials? And um, uh, then Donal uh, Griffith asks, would cross-border treatment programs be a feasible solution in the EU if countries were to share the load and specialize in different rare disease areas, could this sharing of the load reduce cost of the individual treatments and provide greater benefits to patients? Would anybody like to take either or both of those questions? I think I might make some of the trials. Um, we've been involved in almost all of the clinical trials that have come along in pulmonary hypertension over the last 20 years. Um, and I have to say it is becoming increasingly difficult to participate in clinical trials in Ireland at the moment. Um, there's a, a lot more uh, bureaucracy uh, involved. Um, a lot of efforts have been made to simplify, but actually they've made it even more complex by having a, a central national ethics committee, but then it still has to go to the local ethics committee. It's become really difficult. And I think it's probably not feasible to do clinical trials in Ireland, unless you have a, a very big machine now. So with rare diseases, there's rarely a big machine behind it. It's usually very, you know, obviously smaller numbers of patients. It's different if you're doing it on cholesterol drugs or asthma drugs. But if actually you're doing it in a rare disease, to have the infrastructure necessary in those clinical trials, I think is prohibitive at the moment. So I'd be concerned about that. There are other ways, though, I think in response to the question, the clinical trials, there are other things, though, that, you know, patients are getting more involved in is sharing information themselves. There's uh, activity level monitoring, for example. Uh, there's things that can be done that are not uh, quite as uh, rigorous as the normal multi-center randomized clinical control trial, where people are sharing information about what they can do now that they couldn't have done before before they were on therapy. So there are other approaches um, that are, are coming into play, real life collection of data. Um, and I just say then, your, your, the second comment, I think, about cross-border, I think, you know, one of the difficulties is, do you really want to be traveling cross-border if you've got a rare disease? A lot of times what's, what's missing is just some direction from above. Um, you don't necessarily have to travel that distance if it's properly structured and coordinated. So for example, with the ERN, ERN lung, part of the being an ERN lung is that we, we say that we will reach out and travel other places to take care of patients. So as I go to Cork to visit patients with pulmonary hypertension and do a clinic there, that clinic is gone now. It, it was there pre-COVID. It, it really isn't properly supported. We don't have enough staff within the matter to go out to Cork at the moment. So it's, it's falling down. It's a very simple thing. You get on a train in the morning, pop down, see a bunch of patients there and save six people coming up to Dublin for a clinic. I can go down and see them there and bring a nurse down and we can go over things. We've done that on and off over the years, but it's been ad hoc. So the ERNs are set up in such a way that you don't necessarily have to travel. The clinic comes to you. The expertise comes to you. So... I wouldn't try and make life easier for patients, maybe more difficult for clinicians, but as long as it's properly supported, it's very feasible. I think there probably are a few exceptions with some of the new gene therapies and ATMPs and stuff that will require expert centers for administration and you know handling the new, new drugs. But generally speaking, it should be traveling to the patient um, very definitely. Hey, uh, a few more questions. Uh, Sorry, please, Billy. Yeah, yeah no, no, I, I just wanted to, uh, the whole issue of clinical trials, I think, is going to be a serious problem for Ireland. Um, we have a major pharmaceutical sector, yet if you look at comparable countries with just, say, Finland, Denmark, similar populations, um, with not the same history of pharmaceutical industries, uh, well, fairly competent, but not the same, uh, yet they would have do an awful lot more clinical trials than, than, than we would carry out in Ireland. So I just think it's an area where we have to assess why are there so many barriers to clinical trials. It just sends out a very poor signal in the whole area that you, you have your 
pharmaceutical sector, but yet you're not willing to go into the whole area of clinical trials. Just finally then on the issue of a, a national or an, a European register for rare diseases. I think there's two things here. Firstly, if we had a common um, newborn um, heal test for, uh, for, for, for neonates, at least we could build up a detailed bank of the rare diseases and the other challenges that will be placed on the individual, but also on our collective health system into the future. In other words, you can start planning because of, 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 of the diseases um, that, that you've identified and the illness and the syndromes. So you can start putting, you know, training into clinicians, uh, in, in enhancing infrastructure. And you're right, rather than the patients always traveling. So Ireland is building a center of excellence in the children's hospital. It is only but a building. It is what happens inside it is the issue. And, you know, we could therefore um, have a situation where we may not have the competency ourselves because we're a small country, where uh, clinicians could come from abroad every now and again to assist and equally Irish uh, clinicians can go elsewhere. At times you may have to move patients, but I do believe that longer term, the, 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 in my view, it's the clinicians should be traveling to centers of excellence rather than the other way around. But I think the first step is just to build up a clear bank of data of uh, or the illnesses, the diseases, the syndromes, so you can put immediate uh, care pathways in place, but also plan for the infrastructure, both personnel and physical, that would be required in the years ahead. Otherwise, you know, we will have this fragmented system that just doesn't really talk and cooperate with each other. Thank you for that. Um, two more questions here then. Declan Mina, Advocacy Officer for Fighting Blindness, asks, will the government provide financial supports to help patient organisations take part in these HTAs and educate patients? Our health system would be better with more input from patients. And then a question from Porica Sullivan, TD. To what extent is this a rights-based issue, i.e. I could be a patient in Germany or France with full access to a drug, and in Ireland I might be told that it is unavailable to me. To what extent, again, is this a rights-based issue? Uh, I can uh, I can opine on those. I, yeah, um, I guess on the first piece for uh, Declan's uh, piece around uh, patient advocates advocates getting involved in the HTA process, there are routes that enable that. But as he says, there is absolutely no funding, and it is it is a huge issue. I have heard of organisations spending 200, 300 hours putting together a submission, and that's a well funded, well established organization and how do you do it for the ultra rare condition so there's clearly going to be you know challenges and barriers there there's no obvious means for that to be enabled today i would like to see something like ncpe actually you know rolling up their sleeves with the patient organizations to actually say right how are we going to do it where will you find the people this is the layout they give a Q&A but it doesn't really it's not it's it's fine as I say if you have a huge organization but it doesn't really work for for many uh, uh, and there is a need to I guess try and level that playing field that if you're going to use the input of patients then you need to be able to level the playing field that it's not something that only patients that you know have a higher incidence get get access to um the rights based stuff I I'd love to say that I was a human rights lawyer and could really work my head around it I think it probably is a rights based thing uh, but it's trying to work out how do we position that I'm like Ireland has signed up to I don't know how many UN conventions uh, and most recently they were one of the, the, the one of the countries that led not led out on designing uh, a rare disease uh, what was it people living with rare disease uh, uh, UN uh, anyway not a convention but the thing that comes just before a convention the R word not, it's not even regulation anyway uh but but declaration that type of stuff yeah exactly but so, you know around rare diseases and i spoke with our, our mission in in new york and they were really enthusiastic saying, yeah this is brilliant this is great stuff this is the kind of stuff that we should be doing here or you know this is what the un is for to make sure that the sustainable development goals align with the needs of people that are vulnerable in all of these countries and stuff and ireland was one of the countries that was first to sign up to it but you don't really see that on the ground here and i i'm trying to work out what is the link but there's only one of 
give me an RDI and I have a, a limit to what I can actually do. Um, so, so, but you know, I would love if somebody would like to do a master's thesis, if anybody knows anybody on how does this work and how do we make this a human rights-based issue? I would love to see it happening because I think it is a rights-based issue, yeah. I would like to add on that and um, I'll give you an example. So uh, the medical card, uh, if you have epilepsy, we just say, um, you get, uh, a, a, it's a designated disease for a medical card, so all your medicines are covered and that's fine. But if you have other diseases, and many rare diseases, and I'll give my example, my disease, for pulmonary hypertension, you don't, you're not on that list. So if you have a job or your spouse has a job and there's a bit of money, you don't get paid. Now, you, you're on a pump that you have to buy yourself. So you actually have to physically go out and buy a pump that's about 10,000 euros. You need three of them because you need to have them stored in case one of them breaks down. You need an infusion that's going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you need bandages and tape. You need oxygen a lot of time. You need electricity for the oxygen, et cetera. That isn't covered by the state. Now, to me, that's a rights-based issue. Um, why is one disease covered and another disease isn't covered? Why is the disease that's really expensive not covered? And in fact, we tried to fight this in the past. I'm the only person who listened. I don't know if you'll remember, Ben Keller, but you and I met in the doll you when you were uh, you, when you were there as the spokesperson for health, and and you really were great and welcome to try to push that forward before you disappeared to Europe, and it was great. It was good to have. I'm you. here. I'm I, here. I'm I here. mean that as a very positive because uh, it was somebody listened to us. We went in with a group of patients and we we tried to get people to listen to us, but uh, the door was opened by uh, by a few people, and we had a good old chat about it. And I think that is a right issue because it's not fair that somebody uh, is suddenly becoming. Uh, poor and poor and and potentially, in fact, that the person in question that we met that day in the doll uh, with you ended up having to give up their job so that they could support their wife because their money was they had too much money. So those things aren't their rights based issues. I think that that's not appropriate. You're already bad. Life's bad enough when you get a rare disease, but to be told that you're also now going to cost you 500, 600 a month just to live with that disease is inappropriate. Yeah. Just on the rights issue, I mean, look, I mean, the, the European Union is um, is a political construct, so it's underpinned by um, the acquis and by, you know, the treaties themselves. So, I mean, the difficulty here is that we don't have any legal um, standing around the issue of conferring rights on individuals in the areas of health. Uh, bear in mind, we had that particular very, very divisive debate many, many years ago in Ireland around the whole issue of you know, uh, the European Union telling us what to do in certain areas of health and health care, particularly for women uh, and, and the whole issue of the, the, the Eight Amendment at the time. So, I mean, there is that issue that governments, uh, because of budgets, but also because of, you know, different cultures and attitudes around uh, the areas of health, have been guarded and very guarded in allowing any interference by Europe in the areas of health. But now I genuinely believe that the, the sands have completely shifted the fact that we actually have a committee established here to talk about a health, health union is fundamental. Of course, if you want to confer a right on an individual, you have to have it in the treaties, and certainly that would require a treaty change, which would be very difficult. But I think, look, the the, the you know sometimes perfection is the enemy of action, and I would like us to get through as much as we can. Um, the treaty changes would have to come at some stage but in the meantime we could certainly do the medical assessment centrally we could certainly do the approval centrally and i believe we could do reimbursements centrally as well uh, and that would be a good start and then we could certainly do centrally the whole issue of um the newborns but as Padraig O'Sullivan who was my local TD so I have to answer to my local TD uh, I live in his constituency um at the moment you can confer that right but I believe there is a moral issue here at stake that if you are born in Bucharest or in uh, Dublin, that you should at least have the same chance when born for access to healthcare. Thank you for that, Betty. I would have thought any rights-based system is based on the fundamental principle of equity of treatment, and what you have described is not equal treatment, and that, that immediately makes it a, a, an issue of concern. Um, two questions, one uh, for Sean and two questions for Billy. Um, Volkan Yilmaz uh, from Dublin City University has asked me to ask Sean, where does he see the role of primary care in diagnosing and managing rare diseases? Um, and Billy, he asks a question for you. Um, how could Ireland link its rare disease strategy to Slauncha Care? And others may have views on that uh, as well. And then um, just as, as the time is going on, I'm going to ask the final, final question, which is from Jill Donoghue, the Deputy Director General of the IIEA. 
And she asked the question about the new industrial policy and Ireland's participation in the health IPCEI. Um, important projects of common European interest, which specifically mention rare diseases. Could we use the funds now being made available in the new policy to train up people with 2 billion euros available to get the staff mentioned by uh, Professor Gain to be trained? So could I give you some question? primary care? I think it's a very, very good question. Uh, in my area, it takes, uh, the patients have symptoms for two years and see it on average four doctors before the diagnosis is made. So uh, in our guidelines, the new European Society of Cardiology and Respiratory Society uh, guidelines, right up the front is general practitioners. So we have a campaign of education in general practitioners. General practitioners always embrace these things because it's their patients there and uh, they're the ones sitting there challenged by the symptoms that all don't add up. The patient is breathless, but why are they breathless? It's not asthma because I've given the inhalers that it works. And so they're really do engage. So I, I think it's very good. Yeah, primary care have a huge part to play in being the first eyes and the first uh, the first person to, to, to really start thinking. Not everything's common. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's a rare disease. And, and it'd be great then to be able to launch into the system, know where to go next. And, and that's the, the next challenge. Katie, would you like to come in then on the Sláinte Care issue? Yeah, I think from the point of view of Sláinte Care, look, I mean, I actually sat on that committee, the Sláinte Care committee, before I left and disappeared over to Europe. But as somebody said, Daddy, are you, are you retired to Europe? No, but um, um, the issue really around the rare diseases and primary care. I mean, I'm saying this now as a lay person, but as a practicing politician for many years, it was very much dependent on the GP you met or the GP and maybe the ancillary supports around that particular practice, that there was no uniform pathway that in the event of the GP being unsure that there was a quick referral system. So it depended on the capacity of the primary care uh, center or the GP themselves to have an idea in the first place. And I simply think when we're talking about rare diseases, bearing in mind the 7,000 of them, we're a very small cohort in the overall uh, population of Europe that our GPs could have that fundamental knowledge. But there should be a seamless, immediate pathway for referral on. And I have cases, um, and uh, I'm sure Sean and many others as well over the years, where like you are going maybe for four or five years through a journey to get a diagnosis uh, because, you know, it just the system didn't allow for that. So that's why there has to be, uh, a, a, first of all, a neonate um, system in place of, of testing. But beyond then that, if there's uncertainty around it, that there's a seamless pathway. And that requires potentially even international or European wide support. So in other words, you may not have the capacity for every specific area, but clinicians and, you know, cooperation across the European Union, I think could speed it up. But um, I just think the slide of care puts a lot of emphasis on primary care and rightly so, but primary care will only do the job if the resources are put into primary care in the first place. The building, as I said, without the clinicians and without the support staff is, is just a building. And that has been our weakness very often in not having teams of people that can support the primary care frontline clinicians and support staff. I'd love to just jump in there just, just around this, this whole topic. It's, um, I guess, the feedback that we get as, as a group from people living with rare diseases around the country is uh, their GPs generally don't know that for some they're being gaslit, kind of, there's nothing wrong with you, you're fine, and eventually they'll come up with a diagnosis. I think we need to go right back into the med schools, into the nursing schools, right back into all of those schools, physio, dentistry, everything, and give everybody an opportunity to say, this is potentially a rare disease, rather than putting it all on just the consultants to actually come up with that diagnosis. And I think, you know, I, a UCD, as far as I know, is still the only med school that has a module on rare diseases. None of the others do. And therefore, we have teams of healthcare providers going out thinking everybody is sick with a common disease because they've never even heard of what is a rare disease. They don't do anything around genetics. They're not being upskilled. And now, we, you know, we have our new genetic strategy launched in December. And, you know, a key component of that is how do we upskill everybody, get them to actually think about this stuff as a first, you know, thought process. Um, so, you know, we we go out with campaigns. You see it, the, the, the States has a fabulous con, uh, ca campaign. Uh, the, our equivalent in the States, Nord, is, is what they're called. Um, uh, but uh, th theirs is, um, what, what is it? It's a zebra and it's kind of like it's not always horses. When you hear hooves, it's not always horses. Think zebra. 
And we don't do that in this country. And I think even as just a starting point to say, if we did that, we could probably reduce that 37% waiting over five years for a diagnosis. Just add one little comment to that. When I was leaving Hopkins, which is now over 20 years ago, they were redesigning their medical school curriculum and they came up with a new curriculum, which was genes to society. And the notion was that the future medical students had to start with the basic genome, know where it can be wrong, and then work up from there to see where it can impact on society. And that is a great way of knowing about rare diseases because ultimately so many of those rare diseases start at that understanding of the genome and then finding out little changes make all the difference. Little change here or there and you've got uh, sickle cell, you'll change here, you've got cystic fibrosis. So genes to society is a way and uh, that's now the medical school curriculum in Hopkins and I'm sure many other places in the US, but it's a 20 year old story. So when you retire out of medicine, you're going to go into the med school and change that system well. for us, yeah. Like, like like Billy flying off to Europe, he'll be flying <laughs> off to <laughs> the med schools, we hope. Well, with that thought, we could we could end it. But I'd just like to give the panelists and Billy, if, if there's anything, any further points you'd like to make, um, any last thing you'd like to say, please feel free. I think we but need look, to put Europe to work for us. Sorry, Billy, we need to put yeah, Europe look, to work I, for I us. Just say, I, I just think we're on the cusp of something great in Europe. Um, it's the start of a process where we're literally changing um, the whole political apparatus of Europe in terms of how governments uh, fund healthcare, the decision-making process, who's responsible, who's ultimately uh, accountable. So it will take time, but look, I believe that we should all engage in this process. Every one of us, uh, healthcare providers, the pharmaceutical sector, medical devices, governments, NGOs, advocacy groups. If we get this right, if we get this right, we will serve generations of people into the future and we will confer what we were talking about earlier on equality and citizens across Europe which ultimately is what the European Union is about so I think it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, we must be patient but at the same time ambitious and I think we can get there best of luck and thanks very much well, thank you all very very much both to our panelists and to to our audience online and here and um, let's hope all this optimism is justified thank you very much thank you Thank you.